So good morning to those of you who are watching with us online, and for those of you who are here today on this holiday long weekend that we've had. I hope many of you or all of you have had some good moments together uh, with whomever you were able to celebrate or spend time with this weekend. I also acknowledge that this was a little bit different than normal because of the uh, situation that we find ourselves in this year in, in our world, but because of COVID and things like that, maybe you didn't get to do some of the things that you normally do. And so I acknowledge that this time could be a little bit sad, it could be a little bit painful, difficult. Uh, you, you didn't get to do some of the traditions that you normally do or, or see all of the family that you normally see or, or spend it together in the way that you normally do. Um, you know, there's masks or we're eating outside and a lot of different things that I know that we had to navigate and people that we didn't see that we normally see. So it, it was different. It's a little bit harder. Some of the traditions that we have, we didn't get to do this year. And speaking of annual traditions, uh, I know that one of those is typically, for a lot of people, Black Friday. That's a tradition. Um, and maybe this year was different. I don't know. I was kind of looking at some of the statistics, and some of you, maybe you didn't get up at 3 a.m. and freeze your butts off outside waiting at Best Buy or something like normal, and that's good. Uh, but. Maybe you went online. Instead of standing in line, you went online. I was reading today that over $9 billion was spent online on Friday. Nine, I didn't say million, billion. It's the second highest online spending day in the history of online spending, second only to 2019 Cyber Monday. That's nuts. $9 billion. That's just online that was spent yesterday. So. Uh, maybe you didn't save any money. I don't know. It's like some people, well, maybe this was good for us. We saved some money. We didn't go out shopping, and, but maybe not. Maybe you went online and lost all semblance of self-control. Uh, but today I want to address the issue at hand as it relates to what Pastor Keevan already spoke about, what Black Friday and this time of the year has turned into for most of us, and it is the issue of money. We are in the final week of our series, Lines in the Sand, and we've covered a lot of difficult subjects. None may be more difficult than, than this one, uh, and yet at the same time, like a lot of these subjects, we say, well, it's really not that difficult for me. It's like we don't recognize the difficulty we have with the subject matters at hand. But we've covered politics left and right. We've color, covered spirituality, spirituality hypocrisy and sanctification, suffering, or hope, personal faith, or the local church. And we're saying that a lot of times we have these lines and it's either or that we draw these lines. And yet the reality today is I want to talk about money as we look at wealth, if you will, and I want to talk about guilt or greed when it comes to our money. Thus far, there's been a lot of both ands when we get to the end of these messages that that Jesus comes to help us know that the lines that we have drawn are are not actually lines that he's drawn, that it's it's both and. There's a little bit of of what God is doing on this side. There's a little bit of what God is doing on that side. It's not either or, but what we're going to find today with this particular subject is it's probably neither nor. It's not guilt or greed. And as we've emphasized each week as Christians, we too easily dig these very deep lines, dividing issues, if you will, and and there should be room for nuance in the life of a believer. That's a word that you probably ought to look up because we don't have any nuance in our culture. There's just not any. It's, It's like there's no shades of anything. Everything is just very black and white. And yet what we find in Christianity and what we find in relationships is that there's no cookie cutter way to apply every little thing. I'm not talking about biblical truth. I'm talking about relationship and nuance that we often do not find or have. We're too quick to slander one another with labels, and it keeps us from loving each other and listening to each other, and, and we often miss out on the things that God wants to teach us through our differences because we're too busy with the labels. And maybe you received the email that I send out each week with a video and a, a few little things that I talk about. And if you don't, if you're on an email list, you should be getting that. And I'd love for you to watch that and let it encourage you. It takes about maybe uh, eight to 10 minutes of your time once a week. 
And I talked about this issue even this week that we're too quick to slander and put labels on each other. That it's almost impossible to label a person without knowing the life of a person. I'll say that again. It's impossible to label a person without knowing the life of a person. So in the words of many great therapists, stop it. Just stop it. We shouldn't do that. But here's something interesting. It is imperative to see somebody else made in the image of God. And guess what? You don't need to know anything about them to be able to do that. You don't need to know anything about someone to see them as someone made in the image of God. So what about money because a lot of us have made judgments about people. We've labeled people around us because of things that we've seen or or perceptions that we have about someone and their money. We are probably the most affluent nation in the world and affluence is one of our pillar goals in our American dream. Right, that we would be affluent, that we would be self-sustaining and autonomous. So I bet if you're like me, you've jumped to some conclusions about people and money and wealth. Maybe you have it because you're more holy than I am. But in case you have jumped to some conclusions, maybe you looked at someone's vehicle, maybe you looked at someone's watch, maybe you looked at someone's spending habits and, and what they did with their money, and you jumped to some conclusions like, well, they must be selfish, or they must be greedy, or, or they must be really self-centered and, and a snob, or whatever other label that we can put on somebody because of what we have perceived and what we have seen. How could you spend that much money on a car? How could you spend that much money on a watch? How could you spend that much money on a pair of shoes? You could have used that money to to feed the poor. You could have used that money to do some kind of good in the earth and to, to support ministry or give to the church. And that's where we begin to want to push guilt on people because of money. This is the guilt side of the line, if you will. But before we get all self-righteous, I want us to think about a guy named Judas. If you have your Bible with you, I want you to turn to the book of John, chapter 12, verse 3 through 8. And here we're going to see a story. Maybe some of you are familiar with this story of Mary pouring out perfume on Jesus' feet. I want to read from this particular passage of scriptures, verse 3, chapter 12. It says, Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard. Anybody got any nard on them? Okay. Just checking. And anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Verse four, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to whatever was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have with you, but you do not always have me. Now in the context of this story of what I just mentioned about affluence and and money and wealth, greed and waste and all of those things, this story troubles me. If I look at it from this context, this story troubles me. Why? Because if anybody was passionate about taking care of the poor, it was Jesus. If anybody was passionate about the trap and the destruction and the danger of wealth and putting our hope in money, it was Jesus, right? He was the one that was, would have been the most passionate about this. He said it was impossible to serve both God and money, that you will love one and hate the other. He told his disciples to, to leave everything that they had and to follow him. He also taught them to not store up treasure here on earth where rust and moth will eat it up and thieves will steal it, but to store up treasures in heaven. This is that guy. Yet he decided that it was perfectly fine for Mary to waste a year's worth of wages on his feet rather than donate it to the poor and give it to the church. Why? I mean, there's nuance right there. But here's the big idea this morning. The motive of the heart is more important than the money. The motive 
of the heart is more important than the money. We've elevated money to a godlike status. It has taken a place of idolatry and worship in our life. And Jesus is saying that a year's worth of wages is nothing compared to wholehearted praises. Come on, that rhymes, so you ought to remember that. Listen, your wholehearted praise matters to me than, than a year's worth of wages because my money is just not nothing to me as it relates to what God has and what he's able to do. Jesus wasn't being callous about the poor either. It was a really thinly veiled hint to Judas that if he was really concerned about the poor, first of all, he would have been stealing from the bag and that he would never lack opportunity to help them because they would always be with us in this earth. They were always gonna have needs to minister to in this earth. There's some nuance here when you don't force a hard, fast rule onto every situation. As every situation has some different kind of circumstance surrounding it. And what God cares most about is the posture of the heart. Is God's glory the goal? The first idea that here this morning is that wealth is not the problem. Being rich is not the problem. Having affluence and money is not the problem. So there's no need to be guilty if that describes your life, being affluent. Yes, there are all kinds of warnings about wealth in the Bible. But there are also many passages within scripture that speak optimistically, if not positively, about wealth. Ecclesiastes 5.19 talks about enjoying the wealth that God may give you. The Bible also says in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, and yes, this is talking about spiritual matters, but it also has physical, abundant blessing ramifications here on earth. But it says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. I'm talking about financial riches per se in this particular passage of scripture, but the riches of God's grace and the blessings that he gives us in this life to enjoy. But here's where we could say it doesn't have to be guilt on this side of the line or greed when it comes to money. The Bible gives room for being outside the lines and labels when it comes to money and wealth. The Bible has all kinds of people who are different, people who are poor and people who are rich, people who accumulate wealth and people who give wealth away, people who enjoy God's provision and people who provide for others through sacrificial giving. It's, it's both and throughout scripture. The main issue, as we said a moment ago, comes back to what is always the main issue. Keevan already said it this morning, it's our hearts. Robert said it last week, it's our hearts. God is always the most concerned for our hearts. So the heart question here is, are we content with what God has given us, whatever that may be? You can ask yourself that question very simply this morning. Am I content with what God has given me, whatever that may be? Paul expresses this type of contentment in Philippians chapter 4. I'll read from verse 11 through 13. Now, this is a passage of scripture in Philippians 4, 13 that we often apply to all kinds of things other than what Paul was talking about when he had this particular passage of scripture. You'll recognize it when we get there. Some of you may have it tattooed somewhere on your body. Now, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is really talking about living life with contentment. Paul is saying that although he has some need right now, which he did in this particular passage, in this context, he had some need. It was not relief of this need that primarily concerned him. He had learned to be content with what God provided, irrespective of the circumstances that he found himself in. I want you to see that Paul had to learn this virtue. Why? Because it's not naturally what we do. We are not naturally content people. 
We are naturally discontent people. And so he's saying, listen, you're going to be in situations in this life where you're not going to be content and you're going to have to learn how to be content. You're going to have to learn how to be content when you have a lot, just like when you have a little. You're going to have to learn how to be content when things are going great and when they're not going great. You've got to learn this because contentment is not the natural default for us as human beings. We'll say, Paul... I guess he learned this. Yes, and you know where he's writing this from? He's writing this from a jail cell. He's imprisoned and he's writing about being content, really to further exhort us to be satisfied even with very little because why? Jesus is our ultimate treasure. Jesus is our ultimate inheritance. That's what Paul is saying. He's the one who's my ultimate treasure, my deepest need. And every single one of our deepest needs is to have God be with us and to have God be for us. And that has been paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross so that he can be our greatest treasure and our greatest inheritance to be content. Now, it's right about this point that because we're human, we say, well, I sure would like to learn how to be content with plenty and abundance. Oh, okay, you're good with that? Okay, okay, good, that's fine. You've learned how to be content. But most of the time, like, look, I got the content part down with not having a lot. I'd like to have the content part with having a whole heck of a lot. Could I have that? Could I try that? So how can we be sure that our relationship with money is actually a healthy relationship? Because money is morally neutral. We say amoral right? But it can still be harmful. It's a gift to enjoy, but it is also at the same time something that should be given away freely. The goal is for contentment to grow in our hearts, and when contentment grows in our hearts, then greed diminishes and dries up in our hearts. It's amazing how those correlate together, right? The greedier I get, the less content I get. The more content that I am, the less greedy that I am. It's also that we are to enjoy the affluence and the wealth that God has entrusted to us while also living lives of generosity towards other people. So we don't have to be guilty and neither should we be greedy. There's no doubt that greed is the root of all kinds of evil. The Bible is very clear about that. Greed is destructive. It's a destructive sin of the heart. It's prevalent, it's rampant in our culture, it's rampant in our Western culture in particular. And a popular approach today is to shame people about their wealth, right? If we don't have as much as somebody else, then a popular approach today is the guilt thing, to make somebody feel guilty about what they do have or what they have spent their money on, to shame people. And I'm not into that, I really am not. I don't wanna make people feel guilty about how much they may have. Because the problem is that's a comparison game. And a comparison game never works in the kingdom of God. In our context, and I'm saying in the West, in America, the comparison game certainly doesn't work. Because if you have more than one change of clothing, eat more than one meal a day, have a roof over your head, drive at least one vehicle, the reality is, is that you are more wealthy in comparison to more than half the world's population. You're wealthy. You're affluent. Because more than half the world's population lives on less than $2.50 per day. That's $17.50 per week. Now, with that comparison, what does your $5 drink at Starbucks look like now? With that comparison, what does your $60 round of golf look like now? I just spent on a round of golf more than some people make in an entire month. So I sound selfish and greedy, but am I? So let's not compare our annual salary and what we spend our money on to someone who has more because there's always someone that probably has less than you do. And this is another reason why you can write this down because this applies not just to money, but to everything in life. Comparison kills contentment. Comparison kills contentment. 
If you're not satisfied, my dad used to say this to me years ago. He said, if you're not satisfied with $50,000 a year, you won't be satisfied with $100,000 a year. And don't sit there, well, I sure would like to try and figure it out. I sure would like to see if I was. So as just about with everything else spiritually, we first have to look at our own hearts, not compare ours to someone else. We first have to compare our own lives and see what God is showing us. What is he teaching us? And what is he, because he always is, correcting in us. I think greed is a silent sickness. It's a silent heart killer. We can always see it in others but we never see it in ourselves. We can always see the speck of greed in somebody else, but we never see the log of greed in our own eye. And this really pertains again to just about anything spiritually. We do this with all kinds of things. We see it in somebody else, but it's not as clear or even visible at all in our own lives. But here's the deal, we are all susceptible to greed. Greed actually has nothing to do with the amount of money that you have. It's the desire, it's the heart. That's what I'm talking about. It's the posture of your heart. It's a sliding scale that can never be satisfied. In my 23 plus years of ministry, and I've sat down and talked to a lot of people about a lot of subjects, about a lot of things. I've heard a lot of confessions about a lot of sin in my life, in someone's life, or just bringing something they're dealing with. I have never, ever heard somebody tell me, and confess the sin of greed. Never. Nobody's ever said, ah, Pastor Brent, I just got to confess, I, I am greedy. I'm full of greed. So how do we see this insidious sin? How do we see this secretly darkening sin that kind of covers our hearts and lives when it seems to be something that it's, we're totally oblivious to? Pastor Scott Sauls in his book called Jesus Outside the Lines wrote that there's two symptoms of greed that we should look out for in our own lives. First one is hoarding money for ourselves. And second one is spending money exclusively on ourselves. Let's play a little self-assessment game of true or false. Kind of a true or false spiritual assessment, if you will. I've already failed. So I just wanted you to know, make you feel good. You feel safer when you have more money in the bank. True or false? Okay, thank you, Robert. You answered out loud. Everybody else said that too, right? You begin to panic when the accounts are low. True or false? You get anxious and start freaking out about the future when money is tight. You feel greater confidence when your accounts are flush, healthy, and full. At the same time, watch this now, at the same time that we might feel financially insecure, which that should help us kind of see when we do, we still continue to go out and purchase things that we really don't need for ourselves. Like, I'm feeling really insecure about the numbers, but I'm still going to go buy something. And it's not wrong. Listen, it's not wrong to have stuff. So don't let, you're not supposed to feel guilty because you have things. The Bible allows for liberty and latitude for us when it comes to enjoying things that God gives us. To have nice things, to have a, a, a home or have a house or whatever the case may be. There's some latitude there. I mean, Lydia had a house that was large enough to have a whole bunch of people in it and have a church there. She was a businesswoman in Philippi. And at the beginning of the church in Acts, in the Philippian church, there's there's everybody gathering her house. Well, it's good that Lydia had some means that she could have everybody over so the church could gather. It's, It's nothing wrong with having things. But what we need to recognize is when we move from being those who enjoy material things to being completely materialistic to enjoying the blessings that God has and being completely greedy or money-oriented. And here's where we're at risk. So see if you're showing signs of a sin of greed creeping into your hearts, around your heart. We are at risk when we hoard money in order to feel safe. We are equally at risk when we're spending money exclusively on ourselves. And I might add, with the hopes that it's going to make us feel better or impress other people. 
Whatever your context is, don't compare because comparison not only kills contentment, it also fosters self-righteousness. Well, if I can compare myself to them, then I don't feel bad about the fact that God's trying to show me that I'm actually very greedy in my heart. Although maybe I only have this much money in my bank account, my heart is darkened with greed because that's all I think about, that's all I care about, but I'm masking that because I'm comparing myself to someone that has more than me and I would never do anything like that if I had that much money. So what about you? Let's go down the line. Maybe some things that we have in our own lives that we can think about. Why do I have 52 pairs of shoes? Well, one for each week of the year. I'm not saying I do have 52 pairs of shoes. I'm just saying that like I is a proverbial I. It's all of us I, corporate I. Say, well, I don't have any shoes. Okay, why do I have more firearms than a small militia? How many can I shoot at once? Why do I have more earrings than the world has ears? And don't get me wrong, God invites us to enjoy wealth as well as to share wealth. But what is the motive of our hearts? Are we legitimately saving wealth or are we hoarding to make ourselves feel safe? Are we legitimately enjoying the affluence that we may have or do we have a spending problem where we're trying to fill a void that only Jesus can fill? Here is the truth about money and wealth. God allows us to have wealth, but we cannot place our hope in wealth. So you don't have to be guilty but neither should you be greedy. Here's what we do know. Wealth is not the answer to our problems. We know this. Jesus alone is the answer to every issue, every problem, every sickness of sin that we have. Actor and comedian Jim Carrey said it this way, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. How many more rich and famous people have to commit suicide or have to spiral out of control with debilitating depression or have to do whatever it is that we see going on that proves that money is not the answer. More money is not the answer to the problems of our hearts and our souls. And why is it that we think that the answer is that which often causes more pain and problems? And we come back to our hearts, we come back to it again, and we realize the problem is not having or spending money, it's how our hearts relate to the money that we have that matters. It's not guilt, it's not greed. Let's go back to God's word for two very well-known passages that I have already alluded to. First one's found in Matthew chapter six, Jesus' words, verse 24, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. No, we serve God and then money serves us, not the other way around. Apostle Paul, 1 Timothy 6, but if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. I mean, this is clear. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pangs. Again, the heart of these passages and all of Scripture is this. Jesus is the answer to every void in our souls and our lives. And in this particular passage of Scripture, they're saying it's not money. That's not the answer. We've been fooled by the myth of the American dream of affluence and safety coming through affluence being our ultimate goal and it's gonna come through money. But listen to me, it's a lie. Jesus is our only strong tower. Jesus is our only refuge. Jesus is our only sufficiency. Jesus is our only eternal hope. Jesus is our only treasure. But here's the problem, when our souls and our hearts are empty because of a lack of spiritual nourishment, what would that be? A lack of prayer in my life? A lack of spending time in God's word in my life? A lack of worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in my life, not just on Sunday morning, but with all of my life? 
a lack of being connected to the body of Christ, when my life is lacking those things, then it becomes natural for other things to fill that emptiness. And that would include money and wealth. See, a healthy relationship with money can turn into a love for money. Then I've got a problem. Wealth can turn into greed. Then I've got a problem. Enjoyment of material things that God has blessed me with can turn into materialism. And then I've got a problem. And our souls become even more empty when that happens. See, I, I was thinking about this. Money is too small of a thing to fill the space of the void that only Jesus can fill. It's like trying to fill an ocean with a thimble of water. It just won't work. It's too small and it's too insignificant to my identity to give me the significance that only Jesus can give me. We have to be aware of the times we let money try to do for us what only Jesus can do for us. As Christians, we must constantly examine our hearts and motives as it relates to money. And we examine it through the filter of God's word, the Bible. This has already been stated this morning as well. How do I make money? I run that through the filter of, of my word, the Bible. And even the jobs that I take, is, is this something that will glorify God? Not in its natural outworking of what I'm doing, but am I gonna live a life that glorifies God while doing this job? So how do I earn money? through the filter of God's word? How do I save money? Through the filter of God's word. How do I spend my money? Through the filter of God's word. And how do I give? Through the filter of God's word. There's another parable that Jesus tells his disciples in order to help them understand their relationship to money. And he identifies the root causes of greed as anxiety and fear. Matthew 6, verse 19, do not lay up yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, Jesus is our treasure and nothing else. That's so our heart can be with him. Jesus is our inheritance and nothing else. I'm not taking anything else with me. This comes back to the gospel. We're generous because God has been generous with us. And on top of that, the money that we have is not ours to begin with. God is the owner. We are the managers. We're to use what he gives us, however much, however little, to seek the kingdom of God first. Our priorities are God first. And this should include providing for the needs of those who depend on us, our family. Saving for the future, that's fine giving generously to God's kingdom, and that includes the church and the poor. And when we align and prioritize our lives in this way, we are actively living the kingdom of God, and we participate in something bigger than ourselves, and we participate in something more enduring than our lifetime, the kingdom of God. So what about giving? I'll draw this to a close with this. How much do we give? How much is too much, and how much is too little? Well, let me help you err on the side of too much because I think we've got the too little down. I mean, do I need to help anybody figure out how to give too little? Okay, just checking. I don't want to help myself in that at all. See, I believe the biblical starting point for giving is 10%. It's called the tithe. I believe that it's done by grace, not compulsion. I believe that it's done with joy, not anxiety and fear. And it's done by faith to a faithful God who has never failed me yet and never will. However, only about 10 to 25% of the typical American congregation apparently believes this because only that number does. The same report that put that number out concluded that if the remaining 75 to 90% of American Christians tithed, then global hunger, starvation and death from preventable diseases could be relieved in five years. Additionally, illiteracy could be eliminated. The world's water and sanitation issues could be solved. All overseas mission work could be fully funded and over 100 billion per year would be left over for additional ministry. That's 
that's nuts. Consequently, it holds to reason then that 75 to 90% of those who claim to be Christians in America do not understand the biblical relationship to money that Jesus wants for them and they're falling prey to the sin of greed. This is why greed is not about amounts, but about hearts. It's not about amounts, it's about hearts. That's why God did the amazing thing of a percentage. 10% of my wealth is the same as 10% of Bill Gates' wealth as it relates to percentages, not in the amounts given. But if that's you and you're not one of those 10 to 25% that's tithing and being generous this way, then don't be ashamed, don't be overcome with guilt. Instead, take it to the cross. Take it to Jesus because he's the one that's going to help you. But the initial step in money and wealth, health is tithing. It's starting there. God will meet 100% of your needs according to his riches and glory, which are endless, by the way, as you return just 10% of your regular income back to him. That's all it is. This helps us remember. Why do we do this? This helps us remember that God is our provider, not ourselves. It helps us to remember that he alone is our sufficiency and our hope, not our money. True freedom is found in the reality that everything minus Jesus equals nothing. Mark says it this way in chapter eight, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? And on top of that, more importantly, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Jesus plus nothing. I don't have to add anything. He is my treasure. The good news is that the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, has taken our sin, our cross, our shame on himself by dying for us. Then he defeated sin and death by rising again. And all our hope is with the crucified and risen treasure of our hearts, Jesus Christ. He truly is our all in all. Worship is our response to what we value the most. So we bow our knees in worship to our greatest treasure treasure, and that's Jesus, not our money. And we know this to be true, that our true riches are found in Christ Jesus, because Jesus gave 100% of his life on the cross, purchased us with his blood. He became poor so that though through his poverty, we might become rich in love. When we realize this, generosity will flow out of us and guilt and greed will lose its grip on our hearts and lives as we enjoy the blessings that God has given us and as we live generously by giving to God and giving to others as he directs. And as we keep our hope completely on Jesus Christ alone, our treasure and inheritance and nothing else. I want you to know one of the things that I was praying and I asked Don, uh, one of our elders, Don Lechner, to tell the people that pray every morning before the service, I said, please just pray that we would be different than these statistics. That we wouldn't be 25%. That we'd be 90, 100% of people that saying, greed is not gonna control my heart. God is. And this is how it's gonna start, by releasing the things that I hold on to the most. And all too often, that's our money. 